we're back and we are moving into our first conversation for this morning. We are joined uh, by the Chief Elections Officer, Josephine Tamai, and Chairman of the Elections and Boundaries Commission, Douglas Singh. And we're talking all about the ICJ referendum electoral process. Good morning and welcome. Thank you very much and good morning to both of you and your viewers. Yes. Well, we appreciate you coming in because we, we have quite a few questions about this process. Uh, as I'm sure you know, Ms. Tamai, we had some of the elections uh, officers here yes. very recently. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things they assured us was that you were tying up the details mm -hmm. about uh, how the process would unfold for the referendum. So I want to start there, just finding out what kind of changes uh, had to be accommodated for for this unique process. Okay. Um, well, when it comes to referendum day and the conduct of the um, referendum, section six of the referendum act speaks to the fact that referendum um, shall be conducted basically similar to an election. So in regards to the entire process, the process is basically similar. Where we appoint returning officers, election clerks, presiding officers, um, poll clerks, counting clerks mm -hmm. to man the election because those are the persons who actually conduct elections on election day. So um, we're in the process of doing those appointments as it presently stands. Um, we will have polling stations um, similar to what we have when it comes to a general election. And um, what we are going to do this time around, we're going to ensure that all polling stations are immediately converted to a counting station. Mm -hmm. So counting in all areas will be happening as soon as the polls close and the reconciliation process has concluded. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if those persons will have to move the box before the counts. Mm -hmm. So again, um, that is something because in the past we have done it in some stations and in others we have not. Um, Belize City, for example, we know that Belize City we usually have one central counting station. But um, like I mentioned this time around, that would not be the case all the polling stations will be counting stations. So um, with that, we expect to get the results a little bit faster because each um, presiding officer will be responsible to um, count the votes that is only in that specific box. Mm -hmm. And um, when it comes to the time of voting, it's similar again. You have it, it polls open at 7 and they close at 6 in the afternoon. Um, when the last person votes, that is when we will get the or the count for six o'clock, um, you all will still be able to get the information as you go along as to the voter turnout. Mm -hmm. We still plan to do that um, this time around. And um, like I said, the whole process in terms of persons going in, um, getting their ballot paper, um, the process is the same. When it comes to the announcement of the results, normally you would know that the returning officers would um, announce the results for the, their specific electoral division. In this case, because it's a national issue, then the returning officers will provide a certificate to the chief elections officer with the number of ballots that has been cast mm -hmm. and the number of yes and the number of no. Mm -hmm. So in this case now, um, the chief elections officer would be responsible to compile all the information because it's a simple majority. So it's not to say if one electoral division you have a yes in comparison to a no in another, it doesn't work like that. So every single vote counts. So we want to encourage persons to please come out and um, actually cast their vote. And they need to remember that you need to be registered. That is one of the key things because yeah. even before we get to the voting, you must be registered and you had to come in and register from the 2nd of July, 2018 onwards. And, and, and I want to get into the registration process, so, so let's, let's do that before I, I find out some more answers about the actual referendum day. So w there was a release sent out yesterday or the day before, I believe, talking about the extension of hours for registration. Right, that was yesterday. Um, and so we're trying to accommodate more people coming in to register. Right. How many people have registered so far? Well, so far um, for January, we have 134,000 349 persons who have um, registered. Mm -hmm. The February list is being finalized. Um, we realized that yesterday was the 25th and mm -hmm. that was the deadline for objections and appeal. Mm -hmm. So as soon as um, that process is finished through the courts, then the February list will be finalized. Mm -hmm. Is there an estimated number that you expected to be a part of this registration process? 
Well, um, we were hoping to get more numbers, but when we looked at it and did a comparison and like um, what we were discussing with the chairman, when we looked at the figures in comparison to persons who actually came out and vote, we're at a very good point because um, the last election you had, uh, it was 142,900 persons, the last general election that came out to vote and we're actually at 134,000 plus right now. So we're expecting that the numbers are going up a little, but I will tell you that from when we concluded the exercise in September, mm -hmm. we have seen basically just 4,000 plus persons coming in after that. So it's been slow, but the last Wait, month has you, picked up. Where do you yeah. make that comparison between... Because the number of voters who came out the last election is a representation of voter turnout, right. not of the registered, registered voters. voters. Right. But so why are you hinging that number? Well, well, that's a very important, uh, that's a very good question, actually. And that's, uh, it, in my mind, there's never really been an analysis for someone to ever look to, to understand the process and why. One of the reasons why we do a re-registration exercise is to clean up the list. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people on the list who don't live in the country anymore, who may have passed away and they have not been removed from the list. There's a process to do so, but it doesn't always happen. Um, what that means is that Every year that there's an election, every period that there's an election, there's an increased number of people who vote. But that is a percentage of an increased number of registered voters. New voters. But when you look at the percentage, we were down at 74, was it like 74% or so, of the registered voters that voted in the very last general election. That number was a larger number, not a percentage, a larger number than the previous year that voted. But if you want a yardstick of, of the people who actually exercise their right to vote from a general standpoint, you would go by registered voters. You would go by people who voted, not registered voters. So I could make two comparisons, and statistics are those kind of a fungible thing that you can use it for your own convenience. If I'm going to use a yardstick, um, I will use the number of people who actually go out because that's the only real measurement I have of the people who participate in a process. I do recognize that there are people who choose not to, but if I want to be what I think is closer, and we've done re a re-registration exercise before, and it is always less than when you go through a registration exercise because of the cleaning up process. So if we were to use that from a, just, just let me finish, if we were to use it as an exercise, we would actually look at 134 versus 142, 143,000 which is not an unreasonable number if you compared it to 206,000 or so, which, I th uh, wi wi which was the number of the last amount of registered voters. Now, this was one of the reasons why at the Elections and Boundaries Commission, we had initially advocated for a re District. redistricting exercise before a re-registration exercise because the basis would have been based on the numbers that you currently have. If you waited for the other one and you didn't know exactly where people would be going, you will end up, if it had not been, in, in my mind, if it had not been for this referendum, the turnout for re-registration would have been extremely low. The, it is a referendum, I, I think, that has tremendously driven the re-registration exercise. So a referendum has actually benefited us in a sense of actually getting perhaps the majority of people registered to vote and um, put us in a position now to maybe start looking at a redistricting exercise there, before the next general. There are quite a few assumptions that you made there that, uh, that I think uh, doesn't necessarily resonate with all people. First of all, I think using a number of how many people have voted um, is not the numbers that people would rely on. We're looking at an estimated population of almost 400,000 people. Our last registered total number of registered voters was around half of that, which if we look at the age statistics, is about right. So if we are still at 400,000 people with about half the population being youth, then we should have about 200,000 people registered to vote, mm -hmm. which means you are maybe about 60% of your target, 60, 70% of your target. That, but you see, it depends on what you use for your base. I've also looked at social security registration numbers. Now children going into school, we can actually take statistics of everybody who is an active participant, whether you're receiving some form of a pension, whether you're, at, you're employed, and look at an age group. And you look at the number of the population that is actually below 18 who are not in a position to register to vote. One of the things about the dynamics of our demographics is the fact that a tremendous amount of our population is below 
the age of an ability to vote because of the distribution of the population. What's that so, number? Uh, What's that number? Um, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but there are about 100 and something contributors, 100 something thousand, about 100,000 contributors which are actively employed people. Then you have a, uh, um, a retired portion, and then you have those people who are registered but who are not employed. What's that total number when you? Um, we are probably going to, it, it, we're looking at maybe 160,000, 165,000. I have to go back and and look at that number. But that number is not absolutely accurate either. And when we look at population census, population census does not record, record people who are legally able to vote yes. versus people who are not legally able let's, to let's vote. Let's, let's, let's just let me finish for a second. In, we have at Social Security over 3,000 people who come in as temporary workers, who may be captured as part of that and who have a Social Security card, but who are not able to vote. We have a number of dynamics in an environment, illegal pe people across the board who are who are really just not a, a part of a census, but not a part of a potential voting base. Doug, what Sorry. I hear from you very clearly is is what feels like a justification for what many are seeing as a low no, turnout I'm for uh, the re-registration process. But one thing we can say is that the process is still ongoing. Absolutely. Um, and so it means that there still is time. Anecdotally, I know many people who have not registered who were registered before. So there seems to be a lack of will uh, for people to go out and participate in this process. I can't account for why. But the, pro the point is that we had 200,000, we're at about 130, 140. Mm -hmm. There are a lot more numbers that need to come out and register. I think you can yes. agree to that. But I didn't want to make it look like it was a justification. It was just a different perspective. Because I can, I can appreciate and respect somebody using the gross base. I think both of us may be incorrect from a true standpoint of really what the margins are, because the purpose of cleaning up the roles is really to eliminate the people on the roles that are not there. So the number certainly should not be the last benchmark for the registered also. So from that standpoint, I will concede that one cannot truly look at either number as a true benchmark. That now, is a fact. It also gives us an opportunity to talk about some of the allegations that are being made against the department itself. Um, and this comes directly from the opposition in terms of not being able to get some of their voters registered for a number of reasons. We haven't heard directly uh, from the Elections and Boundaries uh, Department as yet. So I want to give you the opportunity to respond to that. Okay. Well, but, um, but just a second, what is the full of real allegations? What are the reasons why there are people Mr. are not Mai, being remembered? Sure. I'm, I'm sure you know the allegations yeah. that have been made. Well, um, in terms of the media, I've gathered information that um, persons are not able to register because of documentation. And um, we know that we're doing a re-registration to clean up the list. And um, if persons cannot prove nationality, then from election and boundary standpoint, there is absolutely nothing that we can do. Um, yes, you hear different allegations of persons being in other names, but the reality of that is, right, and yes, you will have some persons who have a receipt in a certain in a name. I could come in and say, I'm Josephine Tamai. Remember during that process, some people did not come in and bring any documentation. So you gave that registering officer Josephine Tamai, so they will put Josephine Tamai on the receipt. When the information comes for us to verify, with all the data birth to appearance information, we find out, for example, maybe I'm registered, maybe I'm using my middle name, I'm registered under my middle name instead of my first name, maybe with my mother's surname. So you have those instances. But we can only register you according to the legal documents that we have. So again, um, I want to use this opportunity also to ask persons to please check the registers to ensure that your name is on the register and to see if maybe you're registered under a different surname. In Belize, we know that, yes, it's the father's surname that you use, but many persons are still legally registered under their um, mother's name because the father is not on the birth certificates. No, there's, there's nothing that you can do from the standpoint of, you're absolutely right, legally, if you don't have the proper identification. Yeah. You're almost a secondary sort of capturing point. Um, and so it's nothing you can do about that. But what, what a possibility of what you can do is to recommend to the persons, because you know that you're not just doing this process in and of itself. Right. This process is an end goal mm -hmm. to, an, to a referendum, mm -hmm. which yeah. is a very important process that we need a true vote mm -hmm. from. But you can recommend to the powers that be that, listen, where we are in this process is not an ideal place. And I think that you were talking about the numbers just now. I'm sure you will agree that we're not in an ideal place. 
in terms of getting the maximum amount of person, number of persons registered for this process. When your department was here the last occasion, the public servants were very honest in saying, listen, Mr. Arthurs and uh, Ms. Square, we're about 50% of where we should be. Now, that means one out of every, based on what yeah, the, the, the public servants told us, I mean one out of every two persons who were registered on the last occasion will not be registered in this case for where it is. Now, but what you can do is recommend to the powers that be to say, listen, we're not there yet. Maybe we should look at a different timeline to get this thing finished. Are you comfortable with where we are and what sort of indications have you been given to say, listen, you want to build a house. We don't cast the floor already and you want to put up blocks, but this thing no dry yet, Papa. So maybe you want to hold up before you lay the blocks. Have you had that sort of conversation to see maybe what you can do to speed up the drying of the cement or what you can do to stall the actual um, uh, next process that comes after this? What is the next process that you mean? The ICG for a So, but if I think indirectly you're saying if you're, if you believe you're not ready, then it's a matter of delaying that. Either delaying that's or expediting. A, that's, not a, that's not a position for that's either the, the, the commission or the, 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 the department. That's a political decision. Yes, but the recommendation, surely, my point is that if I am the person at this juncture, the gatekeeper, and I'm watching this thing from where I stand, and I'm saying that this thing is, doesn't have the level of readiness that is ideal, that I surely but, have a responsibility. But, I, but, but you see, but I, though, surely, but you see though, but I don't I surely necessarily have a, agree with yes. the numbers. Let me, finish, for example, let's let me just finish the question. Sure. Let me just finish the question. My, my question is a very simple one. As a gatekeeper, simply there is a responsibility to say, listen, we're just not there yet, in my opinion. Whether or not the politicians and, the polit and political directorate say, we're going to completely ignore you and still continue, but simply whether or not that conversation is had from this level, to say, mm -hmm. boss, we're at 50 percent, 100 and I was looking at the numbers last night, 147 persons in different areas. When you look at the percentage of numbers adding on mm -hmm. since December, it's, it's a trickle. Yes, it it's is. A trickle. It has been. So my question is simply whether or not there's that communication monitoring where we are to say, listen, we're not at 100 percent, must agree with that number, and we're surely not at an ideal number. What can we do to either expedite or to readjust? But first, I would like to make a correction, because I know sure, you please. mentioned, and yes, I, I heard that. my officer saying 50%, but it was not 50%. We've been at 66%, okay. right? So, um, I was repeating yeah, what they said. I know, because I listened to, listen to it, right? And I, guess, you, I guess they made, a, I <laughs> guess they made, a, they made an error, because we also have the information on our website as well. Yeah. So we're at 66%, right? Because um, that was just a couple of weeks ago, so it's basically the same cycle if that was, we're if in. If I was at Western College, I'd repeat but, at 66%. <laughs> <laughs> But um, also, we know that for Belizeans, the trend has always been when we go into any election that people always wait for the last minute to come in. Yeah. So looking at the numbers then, because like I said, over the past months, it's been slow. But this last figure, we've seen whereby we have at least a little over um, 3,000 persons more coming out. So you've, you're seeing numbers building up. And we're also extending the hours to give persons that opportunity to come in. So it's not to say that um, we know we will never get 100%, no. right? So it's not to say that we're at a point that it's so terrible. People are coming out, but just that the part of our culture is we just wait until the last minute. And, and, and I do, I do want to acknowledge, acknowledge the people who feel uh, that they're being disenfranchised out of This is, this is yes. a right that we all have mm -hmm. as Belizeans, right. and I think everyone should mm -hmm. be allowed for this process. Now, the Elections and Boundaries Department is a government department, and the commission liaises with the government as well. So we know, let's talk about the elephant in the room, that vital statistics is a mess. That's just an understatement from me at this point in time. Uh, and we, we have agree. documented stories. We, have, uh, we, we could form a line from here to Orange Walk for the persons who have complaints about what they're dealing with there. So you have persons who need these documents to be able to register. What has been the, I mean, you are hearing directly mm -hmm. as the Elections and Boundaries Department, the complaints. What has been the type of uh, liaising that has taken place? Have you taken the concerns to uh, the, the necessary parties to say, listen, you've got to get this in order because people are being left out of this process because of the failure of another department, not yours, mm -hmm. but another department. Well, one of the things that we do, because um, remember, people still come, we still do verification with vital statistics. 
And um, for those that we cannot find, because we actually have a system whereby we could view the records from vital statistics. When we can't find those, we physically send those documents on the um, sheets for them to verify from vital statistics unit. Because remember, we had a special form that people would fill out when they go to the stations without documentation. And um, we even go as far as trying to find all the information from Social Security to give vital statistics maybe a registration number or something that they could find. So we go above and beyond. But I will tell you that, um, yes, people were complaining. So many persons were left off the list. We had so many persons on pending. And again, those names remained on pending to give the um, different entities the opportunity to find the records, being vital stats or immigration department. Many of those persons have come back in because they do have their documentation and we would accept their applications. As it stands now, um, we have a little bit over 2,500 2, persons who we still cannot verify due to documents. It's not a whole lot of persons, and if those persons are out there and they have their documentation, even though those persons have been disallowed, they can come back in with their documentation. Yes, we know in the past that um, they used to use affidavits and different sorts of things, but during that time, Vital Statistics didn't have a late registration system. Now they have that late registration. So they need to go into the, that department, get their records together, and then come to us at Election and Boundaries. We will take your application as long as we could verify the information. But we just cannot put persons or assume because you were on the list. And, and that isn't something I think any mm -hmm. Belizean would be comfortable with. But my question is, have you taken this concern, and, and I'll ask you oh, that, yes, we have. beyond... Yes, we have. The government is very much aware mm -hmm. of the challenges. At, I, I think to a lesser degree at the Immigration Department, but mm -hmm. to a great degree at Vital yes, Statistics. Because, I mean, we have heard that there are even pages within some logs that may not be there. Mm -hmm. So we are aware of the challenges, and we're sympathetic with the people who actually come out to try to register. That problem has to be fixed. Um, and it's... I can understand that it would be frustrating for people who were in the system because they will come to us and they'll say, I have a voter's card from the, I was registered to vote. I have a social security card. I have a passport. In my mind, a birth certificate should have existed as a source document for one of those things. In fact, it is law uh, uh, with, with respect to social security that you must present a birth certificate. So as Mr. Mai said, where social security can step in because there, there's been this, the department has had this networking and this relationship with three agencies in particular to try to reduce the problem and the burden and to help in whatever way and to use for verification with social security sometimes to verify possibly where you live because people put certain things down but the, the record of employment may say that you are someplace else or the record on there of where you actually live may be inconsistent. Mm -hmm. It's not to disenfranchise anyone, but it is to try to help the process to be transparent. So there has been that, and that, that to a great extent has helped, because in the absence of those things, it would have been chaotic if yes. the department had operated independently and not be able to use technology to tap into these databases. Can you, can you guys help me here, though, because there's something that's eating at me. Um, the thought of anybody who mm -hmm. is entitled to vote and doesn't vote or doesn't have the chance to vote um, is one that, for all Belizeans, I'm sure for you as somebody who ran, um, is, is unnerving. It's a very good. And, and to say it's a small number, 2,500 people is twice the size of the soldiers that we have in this country, bigger than our police department. And when every we look at... Every single one is important. Every single one is important. But I was just referring back to you, saying it's not a lot, the 2,005. 2,005 is an extremely lot of people in Belize. As I go again, it is twice the size of our army, no, it is not really, you know, uh, 1,000 something, no? No, so BDF is almost 2,000 Oh, okay, it's, it's the size <laughs> of our army, good, when thank I you. No, I just like, like the correct numbers. When I, I love it, it I love it. Factual and I, I love it, it, it I love it. But you're talking yeah, about yeah. the when size of... When I'm so saying it's not a and, lot and there's in another comparison to what I've been hearing out in there's the media, figure has been thrown out. There's another point, which is, as the good gentleman said, it's the size of our army. And I'm glad you collected me with that. It's surely larger than our police department. No, but we. I, I and agree it with is. If you look at the numbers as it relates to past elections, because what we start off the conversation with was saying that, from a legal standpoint, it is no different from general elections in terms of the processes. Mm -hmm. And we've seen where in the last couple of elections the margins are extremely small 
it has become a political issue. And so the numbers are important to get the maximum yes. number of persons out there to register what they feel about this issue. Totally agree. So going back to us getting the numbers up, what can we do? I'm, I'm, I'm just really there. And if I there are some exercises that the department can we do? Is, is prepared to do. I know that Mr. Mai has been requested, support from the, from the department has been requested in certain areas where uh, regional leaders, whether they may, may be ch village council chairpersons and so on, have said that we've identified two or three hundred people in this particular village or, or whatever it is. Mr. Mai has sent electors, uh, uh, registration officers out in there. Mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was told that at the call centers there are probably a large amount of people who work there, eight, nine hundred people at some of these places, of which many have not registered. We have reached out to them. They're providing it. They've the managers of these places have sent information to the staff, how many of you are not and would like to be, so that we could actually pick a day and go there and try to do that. We try to get people in mass. Right. In somebody called, I think in some cases where you have very old people who may be mm -hmm. immobile, that you will actually go to their houses. But right. unless that information is presented to the, to the department, it becomes a little bit challenging to actually get it done. What becomes even more challenging is as it gets closer to the date, it's going to be difficult to conduct those kind of exercises because the offices will be inundated with all the late registration. Mm -hmm. And there are only so many, there's just a very short period after the cutoff to actually have that role completed in time for the referendum. When you break down the data, which area has the lowest turnout for re-registration? Um, for George and Queen Square. Right. Belize Belize City? Yes. Belize City? Yes. Belize City right. generally. Belize, Belize City. City generally. In fact, the largest was Toledo. Sand Creek, West, Sand Creek West, Toledo West, I think, was also quite significant. Mm -hmm. Orange Walk North was right. very large. Those were pe people who were up in 80 mm -hmm. 70, 80 something percent. And Belize City, what percentage are we at? Probably 50 it's or less. Right, 50. 50, 50, 50. Belize City, which is the most convenient, one right. would say, because in many of these areas, people have to travel large distances mm -hmm. to do it. Belize City, where it's most convenient, is where the mm -hmm. registration, but it may be the dynamics of po population redistribution. We don't know. There hasn't been a re-registration exercise for 16 years? 21 years. 21 right. years, sorry, 21 years. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. 21 years. So I, you know, and, and we gotta move forward in, in the intro. You were gonna say? No, I was about to say that, um, yes, we do go out. Um, mm -hmm. We recall a couple of weeks ago, we were told that in Kikaka, they had over 700 persons. We only managed to get a little bit over 200 persons coming out, but we do go out. We have had other requests. We have one for um, next week, mm -hmm. even for the University of Belize in Bemopan. They have made a request, but we understand they have basically like 75, pers um, 75 persons, but we're still going out. So based on those requests, people can get registered. So if you, you are out there and you know that you have a group of persons that you want registered, please contact us and we will go out to you. Yeah. And just to be clear, the process continues up until March 12th. You've extended right, the hours. Right. Tell me about that extension. Okay. Um, well, the extension in terms of the working hours, um, we know that many people travel to and from work. Mm -hmm. So at least if we open up until 7, if people are traveling back to their home, they would be able to stop into the office to get registered. And also we've issued um, the notice whereby... ID cards will commence, the issuance yes. of it will commence this Friday. So again, we want pe persons to pick up their ID cards. So if you're out from your district, you could always go in and pick up your cards. And on the Saturdays, again, we know some persons might not be back at, um, in their home, hometown until maybe 8, 9 o'clock. So you have that Saturday that you could come in and get registered. Mm -hmm. And this is because even when we did the mass re-registration exercise, we were open for long hours. We had many different centers, and some people still didn't find it necessary to come out and apply to get registered. So we're extending it again, and we're asking the public to please take advantage of the opportunity. Eight million dollars. It was eight million dollars that was allotted for the re-registration exercise. Right. And about that, yeah. And we spent all of it, and how much is left? Because that's important well, in terms of what we can still, and cannot do. No, but we're still. Um, we still have um, funds. We're still actually. Wrapping up with the re-registration because, like I said, um, we are still producing ID cards, so we still have expenses in regards to those things. So, but we basically have enough funds to carry through for the next because it's less. It's less than twenty days we have left. Right, for the referendum. For the registration. For registration. For the registration. Right. Yeah, yeah. 
But the re-registration exercise continues, yeah. even yes. after the referendum. That's why you will not be able to do it. Continuous registration yeah. cycle. It's continuous. Yeah. The re-registration exercise ended uh, September 30th. Mm -hmm. So it's just continuous, and that will continue indefinitely until there is another re-registration exercise. There's also another point that I needed to clarify, because I know I've heard people talking about needing to go to vital stats to get the new birth certificate. But you actually accept the long-form birth certificate. We accept the certificate. long birth certificates, and we do the, ver um, the verification with vital stats for okay. you. So you okay. can come in with your long birth certificate. Along with a social security card. Right, a social security card, or you could have a justice of the peace sign the um, picture ID to mm -hmm. say that is, you are that person. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I just want to move the conversation, because we can, we can talk about this longer. I think one of the things we've all acknowledged is that we do need, or there is a desire that we will have the right number of people, the people who are eligible to register to vote, come in and vote. And we don't know what that number is, but I mean, I think we can all make a guess that 130 or 140 is certainly not that number right now. But moving forward to the referendum process itself, you spoke of the laws allowing for the referendum to be conducted as a general election, but there are significant differences in this referendum um, and one of that being, and I'll say this very carefully, that it should be an apolitical process. And that's what I want to start off with, because one of the things that we are accustomed to in a general election is that there is a lot of participation from the major political parties. This process should be exempt of that. And I want to get that very clear from you. What will be the level of involvement? I actually, I... <laughs> From my perspective, I don't know that a referendum should be apolitical. I think this particular issue should be apolitical. Fine. I, 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 I agree I, with a difference. that. The referendum could be on many different yes. issues, which could be changing fundamental things that may go along political okay. lines that affect. So this referendum. This particular referendum, I completely agree with you, should be apolitical. I'm disappointed to a great extent uh, to the direction that it has come. In fact, it's so fundamental and in my mind, because the leaders of both political parties support the process, it ought to have been, in my mind, apolitical. But it's not. It's not. And that, for me, is disappointing. So this I, is I'll why there will be, there's a lot of scrutiny as to how this process will unfold. And I want to find out from you directly. First of all, uh, elections observers. Who's been invited to observe the, the referendum? The, well. There, there are two different forms. Well, observers, I think you're talking about internationally. International yeah. observers. Um, Mr. Okay. Tamai has that. I think some of the people um, are already in country, if yes, I'm not mistaken. Yes, I know Commonwealth is um, going to observe. Mm -hmm. I know it, and also that an invitation has been extended to CARICOM. Mm -hmm. and understand that the EU won't be able to make it. They were invited. And um, we also have some of the local embassies who are interested in observing the process. Mm -hmm. So um, those persons will be allowed to observe the process. Yeah. And talking about how uh, the involvement of the political parties, are they going to be allowed into the polling stations? The referendum of the, the AROPA, the referendum of the People's Act, and the, refer uh, uh, and the uh, sorry, representation of the People's Act and the Referendum Act speaks to how the elections should be conducted. And it says in there that it should be as close as possible to a general elections. Um, there, there are provisions in there that allows for the chief election officer to appoint or to accept, is it a point as a word that's used? Um, yes. Give grant no, permission, no, permission, grant permission for parties who want to observe it. Uh, there should be- There are, uh, there are monitors, election monitors. Election monitors, yes. and there should be a release coming out today. By yes. the end of today, I think you want to do, to actually say how that will be conducted. I'm pleased to say that we've agreed to, because we're not sure to a certain extent, to, to what extent the political parties are going to participate. Well, the political, some people may not have the interest. It's a resource-filled thing. And when you have special interests and you're a candidate... You're not sure what the political... What do you, what uh, no, no, as far as being in and ah. scrutinizing, because there's 300 and something polling stations. To have 300 and something people we just, in the... We just had Minister Castro say, listen, my people in uh, Belize Rural, what, that's north, will be out there. My machinery will churn out. But they're that, they're, that's to get out the vote. As far as the monitoring of what goes on within the polling stations, the way it works under the, under the general elections is that each political party has two persons yes, inside of each one. Each candidate, each yes. candidate has two persons in there. 
Um, we're not sure to what extent they're going to put those resources in. There are 300 and something, that's 600 and something people. Some of these people are volunteers, many of them are paid to do so. Will they mobilize to get voters out or will they mobilize to scrutinize the process? So what the elections and boundaries will be doing in that release is to invite other agencies. So we have agreed that everybody that is represented in the National Assembly, which means Council of Churches, the unions, the um, NGOs. Not NGOs and the, what's the last one is for? Besides the two political parties, the business, the community, business community, the business community, that they will all be invited to nominate under their organizations to be a part of the monitoring process. Because we feel, we, I feel that in some rural areas where it's challenging to get people to sit for 11 hours or 10 hours or however long it is and to be a part of the counting process, we will have maybe absent people. Some people may not come for the entire day. We want to ask these organizations to nominate people to be a part of that simply because we don't want questions later that somebody thinks something and somebody wasn't there. You know? So we are starting the process and then we will be engaging them. If we see that the number of names that are coming in are not sufficient, we will actually engage these organizations directly to try to ensure that they are, it is being monitored. So what I'm hearing from you is that you are waiting to see if there will be interest from the political parties to have? No, 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 oh. no, 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 no. The, or have the you release, made that decision? The, the decision has been made. The release will invite all these organizations. Including the political parties. Including right. the political parties. But they will not serve as a political party. They will fall under monitors, monitors. as a referendum. Monitors. They will all be equal. Well, they won't. Re they won't release themselves of any political alignment that they have. No, we no, know no, no, that. No, no. That, it's, that's, the, it's the that's authority <laughs> they have as monitors. They will all have exactly the same authority. One will not, because under the representation of the People Act, there's something called scrutineers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, scrutineers have certain other authority that monitors don't necessarily have. And so we want to make sure that everybody's on the same landscape. They're not there as scrutineers. They're there as election monitors to ensure the transparency and accountability of the process. This is the only referendum we've had outside of an election. Right. And so it is unique for all of us, yes. including mm -hmm. yourselves. So the only knowledge that any person has as to how uh, a ref uh, election or referendum would unfold is what we've seen in any one of the other elections. So let's use that as our basis. We have political parties who take people to vote. That is an independent party decision that doesn't have anything right. to do with elections and, and boundaries. But once you enter that room, we're accustomed to see a blue shirt and a red shirt, and they monitor who come in, mark them off their list with whatever formula they mm -hmm. use to decide who's <laughs> voting for them, and keep track of their voters as they come out. Generally, yes. So what we're saying is we are still allowing for that red and blue shirt to be in that room to monitor who is coming in to vote on this national issue? We are allowing the organizations mm -hmm. to nominate individuals to be in there. If the political party chooses to have somebody in there, they will along with everybody else, all the other organizations. Mm -hmm. It's not color shirt, It's not mandatory. The law does not require them to do that. And that is our concern. Our concern is Ms. Tamai does not have the power to appoint people to sit in there as monitors. All she has to do is to agree to mm -hmm. accept them if they've applied they to be monitors. They have to interest. express their interests and appoint their persons. Mm -hmm. Now, the expertise, though, um, I am in a different position because I think that there's nothing wrong, even though politics has taken a very dirty um, word. And I think the problem is we have a problem with our politicians and where political parties have been treating our people over the independence, post-independent years. But politics is not a bad thing. Um, and to have both of the political parties in there, particularly in circumstances where both political parties have diametrically opposed views. There are only going to be two questions. It's not going to be one question. question. It's going to be one question. There are only going to be two options. It's not BPP, DPM, NIP, and NABR on the battle ballot. It's going to be two answers. And so it, there's, there's not necessarily, to me, the concern that um, there is any difference with having both of them in there, simply because um, the expertise over the years fall not with the churches. The churches have been dealing with the Bible and Jesus. But we will and also so do training. It has not been with the persons. NGOs. It has really been with the political parties that have the expertise. The people who best can tell you, Miss May, this person, you know, you have a problem here, is the 
political parties. My, my question was more in terms of um, whether or not there has been ongoing communication. That's the purpose of, I believe, the Election and Boundaries Commission, to have bipartisan ongoing conversation as to what will happen. And I'm kind of concerned that we don't have the answers to some of these fundamental questions even now. No, in fact, the commission has met twice over the last 30 days mm -hmm. to deal with exactly the monitoring and the supervision and of the election process. we still have no process. answers? No. So we have answers. We have answers. That's one of the reasons why the release is going out. The commission agrees that there has to be that the process that in the act itself, it's a bit, it, it's not great. It gives the, the responsibility and the authority to the chief elections mm -hmm. officer. But the commission believes it needs to, it should be spelt out. It should be more direct. This should be, even though the act says it should be as close as possible, as conducted as a general election, that perhaps we should spell it out again, you know, and be very, very clear on it. So the recommendations of who is included and so on. So in fact, at, at the commission, we're looking at probably the need to define political parties because it is an issue. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of people that represent themselves out to be, a, it is not defined anywhere in any act in this country. It's done in certain other places. But if somebody comes, when, when you're a political party, the elections and boundaries, and you're participating in the process, the elections and boundaries are obliged to provide you with the whole list of voters and where they live. But there are people who may come out and may be contesting something in only one particular area, does not have an office, does not have a constitution does not have anything that probably would require some form of a structure as a political party. They may be a political individual. But it creates these gray areas that needs to be, to be looked at. And this is some of what the commission looks at and say we need to move in a direction where these things are a bit more defined. So yes, and it's a bipartisan approach. It's not a, and, and there's, there was unani unanimity yes. in context of looking at these issues. Yes. There was not a difference, a diversion. In, 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 with respect to that. In fact, I don't know that we've had very many issues at the commission meetings that people don't generally support from. If it's not unanimous, mm -hmm. it's by majority. Mm -hmm. All right, well, what we, what we have to do right now is take a very quick break, and when we come back, uh, we will continue this conversation to find out more about the ICJ referendum process. So stay tuned, we'll be back in a few. When someone you love becomes a memory, the memory becomes a treasure. Channel 5 introduces The Daily Obituaries. The Daily Obituaries will broadcast all death and funeral announcements and memorials to honor your loved one's life and memories. The Daily Obituaries airs on Channel 5 prior to the evening newscast with subsequent repeats at 10 p.m. and 12 noon the following day. It will also be placed online on our social media platforms, all for a standard package fee. Celebrate their lives and memories with Channel 5's daily obituaries. Honor in life and reverence in death. Now we're back and we are continuing our conversation. If you're just joining us, we are getting all the details about the ICJ referendum process directly from the Chief Elections Officer, Josephine Tamai, and Chairman of the Elections and Boundaries Commission, Doug Singh. Now before the break, we were talking or we were getting into the actual process for the referendum uh, on April 10th. And uh, we spoke of the scrutineers and you're going to be uh, sending out a release today, uh, opening up uh, the opportunity to other representatives from the National Assembly. Um, one of the things that we were told from the last visit of the department was that you are also looking at increasing the number of polling stations. Mm -hmm. One of the concerns that people have is, is the voter turnout for the referendum. Um, and it actually, it was a concern in, in Guatemala as well when they had their referendum because once you don't have the political machinery investing the money, although Kevin is saying uh, Minister Castro said happen. so. We have no guarantees, as you would see in a regular election. So you had spoken about increasing the polling station to make it more accessible for persons to go out and vote. Where are we with that? Well, actually, um, we have, we are finalizing the list. So far, we have 344 polling stations. People might believe that, yes, the numbers are down, but they're basically down from a last general election. Mm -hmm because the numbers of registered persons are actually down. 
we try to maintain at least 500 persons in one specific polling station to ensure the lines are not long for those persons. Um, I know that going into some of the villages will pose a challenge for us. And um, we also have to look at the budget that we actually have. So um, it's not that we will be able to go into all the villages that we would have liked to go into. But at the same time, um, we are hoping that people will use the opportunity and put on their national hats. It's something, it's a, it's a pride in yourself and still come out and vote. Don't wait for any political party or for anybody to take you out. This is something as a Belizean that we it's have to do on our own. I know that yes, it has been the practice that people wait for persons to take them out, but I would, I'm hoping that this time around, it would be different. It all depends on hmm. each and every single individual. It's the same thing when it comes to registration. We could have all the centers open, all the hours, but if people don't want to come out, they just won't come out. You know an elephant, you know, if you tie it when it's a little baby with a little cord, even when it gets bigger, it doesn't <laughs> try to burst that cord. It just has been the political culture. Um, but, but just to add to that, um, just one of the feeling that I'm getting just more recently in conversations that I'm having with uh, across the board is that there's a bit of an indifference, which really surprised me. I thought it would have been more fundamental. And, that's where and, that, and, and I get the sense that some people would just, one of the answers that I got was, what difference is it going to make? And I'm hearing it more often than I would have mm -hmm. guessed I would have he heard it. And in my mind then, if a political party or an organization wants an outcome, you have to move those people. Because if it doesn't matter to them, then we'll go in your direction. And that's fundamentally it. And, that, and that, that was my question in terms of, um, so. in terms of I, I'm looking at the, the television. And for every, for every one come out and register to vote, I see about nine yes uh, come out and vote yes. What can the department do from its very limited um, standpoint and mandate to try to encourage, because it's a lack of motivation. And yes, the political parties and the political entities have their role to play. Um, but as a public service unit, um, what can be done from that standpoint? Because it's a matter of motivation. Yeah. How do we motivate people to come out and register? Forget about the political parties no, but and the their talking. That's not the role How of the department. And the department's to role out. is to make sure the process is administered. There is one commercial. And transparently. There's one commercial that I've seen. have a role in yeah. doing there's that. There's one commercial that I've seen where I think a mother's around the table speaking mm. to a very about effective one. Registration yes. So I've seen, I've seen mm. one. Um, but is there a move to do more pamphlets, most, anything? Most what, what are we doing? Yes, we're actually working on those and that those will be out very shortly. And um, we also will put out sample ballots mm -hmm. for persons. We, as a department, we can't tell you either to vote yes or no. Absolutely that is not, not for us, right? Mm -hmm. But we will put out sample ballots so people are familiar with the question give directions as to how you mark your ballot paper, what is a rejected ballot paper. So all those are coming out very, very shortly. And um, on that topic, I also want to, because I know that you have several organizations printing their own ballot papers and doing their own thing. Um, I want to ask those persons because Stop. when the ballot papers are out, Confuse people. you must get approval from the chief elections officer to print sample ballot papers. Mm -hmm. um, Makes sense. They can print ballot papers, but it has to clearly state that it is, um, the, it is not, it is a sample and it is, it is not a sample approved by the chief elections officer. It has to clearly state that because we don't want to confuse people mm -hmm. and we don't want for persons to be having um, papers out there and then on the day itself, they believe that this is the ballot paper that I must use instead of the official ballot paper that you're giving. So all those information we need to bring out to people so that they clearly understand. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, and then I want to get into it because I think the most crucial thing here, as much as we are import, it, the voter turnout is important, is getting the results. And uh, one of the very significant shifts that you've spoken of, uh, of is that you will be the person to, de to deliver the national results to everyone. But the counting process will be yes. simultaneous in yes. what you said was 300? 300 344 polling stations. Polling stations. That's an enormous task mm -hmm. and one that uh, I, I, I'm trying to understand what are going to be the checks and balances put in place to ensure absolute transparency mm -hmm. in those rooms. Oh. Because the difference between when it came to one counting center was that at least you had more manpower available or it would require, it's opposite, less manpower because it's less counting stations. How are you going to ensure that each and 
each individual counting station is doing so in an absolutely transparent manner. Well, remember you will have the monitors in that room. So the monitors will be allowed to observe the counting. polling uh, process and the counting process. Counting um, should not take more than two, three hours maximum in any of those stations because it's basically a, a yes and no. A box of 50, right? nothing more than 500 votes. And you remember, you still have this one returning officer along with the election clerks who will also man each of their electoral division because those are the persons who will certify to the chief elections officer that this is the result for that particular electoral division. Mm -hmm. But it's not to say that... Um, you go by the majority in an electoral division. It's when you compile and combine all the numbers. So we have to check those figures as they're coming into us. You and know, in, in some cases, though, it's geography from a literal standpoint. Yes. Because even when you take these boxes and you put them in one, like, for example, if ITVET is used for the mm -hmm. city council and whatever, you, you actually have several boxes, boxes being counted, counted at the same time. The amount of people that are in there uh, doing so. So it, to a great extent, it's geography and it's done for two reasons. One, that the, you can utilize the resources that exist there. This very scrutineers can be a part of the counting. They make sure the boxes are sealed, the boxes are properly. It's sealed and when they reopen it again, that the same number of votes went in there, comes out of there, and that you will count and you won't be there. In my mind, 500 ballots gets counted in, in, in less than, in very, very quickly. The information yeah. will be out and compiled and the people can go home rather than be there for Counting six, seven boxes But this is going to be a new process because we haven't done it. Well, no, we've no, done no. it in many yes. of the stations before. Mm. Let me Not for Belize City because of, security, because of security issues, but we have been guaranteed that the police does have the manpower to ensure that they have security at all those stations. As it is right now, they have the security in place mm -hmm. at the polling stations. Mm -hmm. And who will be allowed to object to vote? The same monitors in the room. No, they will be allowed. They will be allowed to sign off, similar to any general election, because for accountability and transparency, if you don't have persons observing those, that entire process, it will be chaos. So these persons now have an opportunity to observe from the start up until the end. No, that's, that, that's where I want to jump in. Um, it seems that the focus is on speed. You know, it's faster to do it this way. It's going to be done. Not necessarily yeah, really. speed. I'm just telling you what I'm hearing, and if I'm wrong, then surely. It, it's it's a, that's the really perception the from, from, from standing here. It's a benefit, Accuracy but it's not. First. The, yeah. And that is exactly where I'm going. It seems that we're looking at two hours geography. But the issue here, I think if you ask any Belizean, which do they prefer? They want it in two hours or they want it in three hours with more accuracy and accountability. They will surely, I can speak for them, see they prefer the accountability and accuracy. But it's even no. one of the practical things can about... I, can I just one question here? Can I the, if, question? if it does, you're not moving the box. Once you move a box, it's subject to more interference. And, and, that, is, <laughs> and that, is why, that is why I want to finish the question because that would probably bring light to what your introduction just was. Um, which is that there is the practical and real reality that when you're dealing with all of these different stations, you have a dilution of a number of things. Expertise, for example. What political parties do, and you ran in Freetown for the United Democratic Party, so you understand this, and, were, and are, was the chairman of the UDP, so you don't understand this, is that you take your strongest people and you put them when you have a centralized county mm -hmm. in that area. Because when there's argument of votes, you put your lawyers there, for example, so that they're able to argue, right? Um, and so you have a dilution of that because you, there's no way at 300 and odd stations you will have those people there. There's also the dilution of human resource because some of the same people who are there monitoring throughout the entire day will have to stay for the two hours of the counting. So I know it's already a done decision and in Belize once it's done, I don't care. The Pope can come and say, listen, this needs to be changed and that's not going to change. But surely it's a consideration as to the issue of the dilution of issues of accuracy. Because you just, even the police manning the stations, we have a limited number of police officers. They'll be out all day and they'll be dealing with this. So isn't that something that you probably would have rethought in hindsight, even at this middle hindsight that we are, to say from that standpoint, we're giving up um, the mobilization of the boxes. So we're getting them, not doing the mobilization of the boxes, but we're giving up certain things. 
you know, I have been, as an ex-chairman and as a candidate, I have been sitting in eons amount of counting rooms and stuff like that. I'll tell you, it is rare when you have that level of expertise and attorneys sitting in there. One or two hot spots picked and they're on call in the event they're necessary. But it really is not the picture as you've painted it. We sit in village council elections, town board elections, mu municipal elections and general elections. And the people who are actually in there, that's where the training comes in and that's yes. where the parties with their interests go in and they have to, you know exactly what a spoiled ballot is, what the intent. You understand that elections and boundaries will be conducting training exercises mm -hmm. when it comes to counting all of votes, monitors. when it comes to the monitoring of votes, it comes to, they do all of these exercises. That's why we're putting out the invitation now because training must occur. And we're asking that, 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 that um, release will ask for representation from these organizations to come in so that they can appoint people for training to commence. So all of it is a part of the process. And if you have to train countrywide, you go countrywide and you train countrywide. But th this is not rocket science to a great extent. It's about standing up. You're disagreeing that the political parties put their strongest persons during the counting stations. No, 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 no. What I am saying is because the counting oh. stations has been so... Uh. That in the last general election, the polling stations in Belize City were the counting stations in Belize City. And so, you, in other words, in, I think I, the, the, the YWC, it, it, was, it was spread out. Yeah. It wasn't centralized anymore. And so we're already moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. All of this is a matter of... And that's one of the reasons why the results came out, what once again, faster. It's not I timing, I though. That's nobody was accurate. But... but what do you say to the Belizeans who are watching this right now? Who, if we are to only, if we're to listen to what, what you are saying, that this has become a highly politicized process. The number one fear and, and, and challenge most people had that it was not supposed to be about politics. It was supposed to be about our nation. Mm -hmm. It seems that this entire process will follow along political lines as it does in a regular election. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people? Well, like I mentioned before, it's up to each individual to make their own choice, their own decision, and go out and vote. If you don't come out and vote, then you're giving the opportunity for somebody else to speak on your behalf. We have to take it personal, each and every single individual, and do our part. You know, there is a, the, the word, Something being political is used all the time, when to a great extent, one is saying that it is being politically polarized between two particular mm -hmm. parties. Almost every issue is political. Mm -hmm. There's politics in churches, there's mm -hmm. politics in unions, there's politics in business sector. Everything we do is political if we're taking it on a landscape and on an issue that goes to a referendum, it goes to a vote. Even if it has no interest along political party lines, it is political just by its very definition. What it is sometimes is what it, I think what, what you're pointing out here is this thing has become party political. political in that kind of context, which is the fundamental difference. Because as you rightfully say, politics has been given a bad name. I know. Politics is a necessary part of a democracy. And if you Absolutely. paid attention to the show before, you know we have said this many times before. So when I say political, I do mean partisan, politi uh, partisan political. But the point is, that the expectation I think I had as a Belizean citizen, and as I think we should all have, is that perhaps there would have been steps put in place or additional measures put in place to ensure that what this national issue is, because of the importance of this national issue, that it would have been as best as possible for us to separate the party politics from the execution of the referendum vote. We have people online asking who's going to monitor the monitors. That's the kind of trust people have. Mm -hmm. Distrust, really. And so when we talk about you know, the person who will get up and say, well, that's a no vote or a yes vote, being a political operative or a party political operative, that's how people feel about this process. And we're really depending but on the independence of the department to be able to ensure what should be more of a national issue than having to do with red, blue, green, or purple. Uh, you know, there's a, there, are, there are all these dynamics going on on this particular issue, which has created, to, to, to me, in my mind, a tremendous amount of confusion for some people, and a tremendous amount of indifference by some people. 
you hear out there that, is, that you need to extend this thing longer because more information, and this is set aside from elections mm -hmm. among Jews, this is, this is the issue of the referendum, um, that the, there, there's not enough information out there. The information is bombarded out there from many different areas with their points of view. Some personal, slanted information, points of view, etc. But there's an incredible amount of information mm -hmm. out there. If anybody wants to get information on the internet on, on, on this particular process, they can get it. Some people may want you to go to their doors and knock on their doors and say, I, "Let me sit down in your living room and explain to you what my perspective is, is on this." But there is not a lack. Of, there is not a lack of information. This whole particular process started off with, I, un, I thought, both political parties saying, this is my point of view, uh, leaders saying, this is my point of view, but the people within the political parties are allowed to do what they want to do. Somewhere within the process, individuals thought it was too fundamental an issue not to participate more and to influence a particular outcome. I am one of those people. I fundamentally believe that because I do not think that, so I, that we should stand by and do absolutely nothing. I think leaders should lead. If the great, right, honorable George Price was alive, he would be doing it. He would influence the outcome. The very man we, t we take as a father and the father of this country would have been doing so because leaders should lead. They're both deciding which direction they're going to lead at this point in time. So I have no difficulty with the whole process that is going, because that is what you're supposed to do on a fundamental issue of sovereignty and ownership of your land. I, I want to go back. So to me, this is a very political issue. What I am disappointed about is the polarization that it has taken, because it's so, it, it creates far more confusion as, as to, for people as to what is right I and want, wrong. I, I want to go back. But I think it is a I, very I, political I want, issue. I want to go back, because part of the issue is, and I, I hear what you're saying, you've, you've said it, mm -hmm. um, uh, here and I guess you're trying to emphasize it, your, your repetition of it. But my problem is not necessarily the confusion and the other things because those to me can be cleared up if we put the right things forward. My issue is the distrust. Mm -hmm. And over, let's just look at factually, and I'm talking not necessarily the referendum vote, I'm talking about simply with the elections and boundaries department. We've, we've seen over past elections, this is no different from any other elections, mm -hmm. where there have been issues and criticisms which have matured themselves all the way to court cases. We've had election petitions for, I guess, two elections in a row, not two general elections in a row. No, look, only one. Only one. Well, um, in Belize rural, right. rural South. I'm talking about the last two general elections. And then there was also the one in relation to the PUP issues on the last um, general elections. I'm sure there were election petitions for those. Maybe not from the department. Maybe it would be something um, where somebody would take something to the yes. court. Yes, but, not but, but, but the, the, point, the, the, point, the point is that there has been a series of complaints against the department itself. The last one being manifest itself in the San Pedro incident. And this, the wounds of that still being quite open. We also have the issue but, but recently. But we you, also have you the finish, issue. I'd like to address yes, that particular please, issue. Please, please, please. Because that is the question. The other issue is that we still have other issues being joined on. We have the recent legal opinion in relation to what the process really is. I want you to speak to, as you would like to, to speak to the distrust of what is coming out of it. Because even looking at the different arms of government, we have the executive of government who, in the cabinet, who has said, yes, we think that this is something that should be a yes vote. And the executive is really the bosses of the elections and boundaries department, so to speak. How, what are we doing in terms of getting that trust from the Belizean people to say, listen, after this entire process, this is a true vote? The executive is not the boss of the elections and boundaries. There's no, the minister. There is a, the minister is not the boss. No, no, there is an administrator. <laughs> it, is, it is part of the tenets of our democracy and whatever it is, and it's completely structurally different. There is oversight. There's authority on the part of the commission. The commission is by partisan. Two people are elected by the people's united, by the opposition. Two people are elected by the 
um, the, the party in government and one is one by the governor general. I love the theory. No, no, but the, the point, the point that I'm making is that different. oversight is there, even if there is, there, one could say there's a bit of control in one direction. But let me go back to the, the issue of mistrust, sure. which, is, which is fundamental and the examples that are being used, because sometimes we miss the forest for the trees. In the case, the most recent case of San Pedro, what created the issue? A misunderstanding of individuals who wanted to create mischief. So it is not the, the department comes into disrepute for very little to no practical, and as was determined in court. These and, and so then it becomes gospel that your honor scrutiny. Well, if one ever looks at the evidence, the department has been vindicated a hundred percent of the time in the court system. Why would that lead to any one incident that creates a disrepute? Let's look at the facts. Because in that particular situation, in an effort, we're there because in an effort to provide information to the media, the Elections and Boundaries Department started a process that every hour, it did an hourly count, and it provided that information to the media so that the media can report on it. At 6 o'clock, at the close of a polling station, they provide a 6 o'clock report, and everybody assumes that that's the last number. There are two, three hundred people in the line. But at the time that last person votes, you're packing up a box, you're, 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 you're reconciling and you're going towards counting. You don't give a 645 number, you don't give a, you know, at that point. And so somebody says, well, the numbers are inconsistent. When the very political parties who were a part of that process knew they were people it and knew it and all signed off on it. The point that you'll I'm making that, is... You'll accept, you'll accept that in politics, perception is reality. Well, that is very true, but it doesn't make it right. right. And, so when and we trust is an issue no, of no, perception. But when we as educated people are part of the media sit here and repeat it, when we know for a fact that you, it's not there, we perpetuate the problem. Do you agree yeah. that, do you agree that um, trust yeah. is predicated on perception and so it is not and perception is fanned by people who continue to repeat the same misinformation and so and the, and the point here the point here mm -hmm. that i think you've also pointed to in your response is that the department mm -hmm. takes a level of scrutiny because of what has happened and so you can't discount it simply because it's not favorable to a particular view that a particular person might have. No, but because I can't, there sit, here, a reality but I can't the sit here and hear it being particular people continue Pedro. to say the mistrust based on whatever, when look at the facts. The facts speak for themselves. There should be, there should, there should I don't know that there has been an incident, a factual incident. Let me give you another example. Let me, let me give you one final example because we're running out of time. Let me right. give you another example, right? I will defend the department. I, I, know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But, but, but what we're can not can getting I, can to I ask is this, the question that you first asked can, of the mistrust, which you acknowledge exists. But I, it I exists. Want to it doesn't mean that it, it's, it's fact-based. And that's why I answered as I did. I want to say from a department's standpoint, right, that the whole issue of trust and people bringing things across, we have no control over that. That will always remain. Um, anything can be challenged. People will say things. But from a department standpoint, I will tell you that all officers, and when it comes to the whole process itself, it is public officers who conduct these elections. And these are officers who are trained to do such. We ensure that we have steps built in place to ensure that persons don't make these allegations. We can't stop the allegations from coming forward, but again, in the court, it has been proven. And I want to assure the general public that we have systems in place. This is not something that, this is the first time public officers are doing. It is something that we do, that the public officers do over and over and over. It's not the elections and boundaries department that conduct elections. It's the public officers that administer it. So the, the mistrust of a department also would have to be mistrust of the entire system of every public service, whoever they are that's working in there. There are very few elections and boundaries employees, so there's not one person that we can have in every polling station. Even when it came to the petition, people felt, oh, they took the election and boundaries department to court. It's the returning officer. I, only, I was only a witness. I was never taken to court because I don't conduct elections. And like I said, I want for people to be assured. And that is the reason why we have the monitors there. Yes, people might say, who will monitor the monitor? And then if you get somebody to monitor those persons, who will monitor those persons? And we can go on and on. We have to have some trust in the system. Um, 
we have to make it open and transparent, and that's the reason why we want to encourage the organizations to appoint monitors to be in those stations. We have mm -hmm. to trust somebody at some point in time. Can I ask a hard nosed question? Because I know you're very competent to answer these things, and that's the only reason I'm asking this question. If I didn't feel that you could answer the question, I surely would not ask I don't know this if question. I can answer it until you've asked it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, you know, in, in looking at the entire landscape and the issue of trust, because I think that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, as, as you said, I think that um, politics has taken a hit, and we need it. Politics is simply defined as who gets what. It's a, it's a system of determining who gets what and how they get it. And we need it in any democracy. Politics is what it is. Um, but partisan politics has been our problem. And the issue of trust, to me, is the central issue. And when you have an electorate who has lost trust in its leaders, that's like the worst thing ever. And I was looking at the, one of the dynamics, one of the things that popped out at me was a, a partisan political issue. I noticed that the, you, you are the chairman of the Election and Boundaries Commission. Correct. And you were a candidate for the United Democratic Party in the Freedom Division and RAN. And you were also the chairman of the United Democratic Party. Correct. Um, Mr. Alberto August, his role recently was chairman of he something. Still currently, is, uh, he's a chairman of the United Democratic Party. And he had some role in the elections and boundaries? No, that was before Never. he was he chairman. Was one of the before he was chairman, correct. he was also the chairman of the Elections and Boundaries Commission. That is correct. Yes. And then he became the chairman of the United Democratic Party. Sometime in between, but I don't think they were simultaneous. Yeah. Could you see where the, some of the persons, because it includes both UDP, PUP, BPP, would think the people Could we choose somebody else other than both just political parties? Bold? Both political parties will choose the people to be on the commission that they believe best understand the process. If you don't understand the process, you don't understand the roles and all the different issues associated and with And there's it. nobody else who has not run or who doesn't have interest in there being... Pr there probably is, but the, the, parties, is a very powerful the party guy. also wants to put the people there that they believe can handle the circumstances. There are two attorneys on the commission of the five people, one on both political parties' side. So they, the parties put their guns there, and they put the type of guns there that they think is necessary to give the proper oversight and protect whatever interest that is. And if both parties are protecting their interests, the system works. The checks and balances work. It's when they both collude that you should need to start to worry. Okay. <laughs> and that's what the fringe parties are saying. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are out of time with this conversation. <laughs> uh, I, do appreciate, I do appreciate you coming in and being able to answer these questions because as I said several times before, it is a unique process for everyone and so we needed to understand as best as possible how it's going to work. A um, Couple of notes that you made. One, the extension of the hours for the registration mm -hmm. uh, that people can take note of so that they can get themselves registered uh, by March 12th if they want to participate in the referendum process. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having us. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll be telling you more about the Give Your Heart to a Child campaign. So stay tuned.